All right, I'll get started while everyone's else is trickling in. Um, thank you. Welcome to this month's Wild Catalyst Seminar. My name is Chelsea DiGiuseppe. I'm the Marketing Manager for UNH Innovation. Uh, this year's Wild Catalyst Seminar theme is launching research-based startups. Um, and so our aim is to demystify the startup process and explore opportunities, challenges, pitfalls um, of launching a, bi a business by hearing about real-life successes from the innovators and entrepreneurs themselves. So while the topics are general um, and universal to all entrepreneurial-minded individuals, um, there is an emphasis on starting a business based on um, university research-born innovations. Um, so we've been really excited to explore that intersection of academia and um, entrepreneurship. So before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to say a big thank you to our generous sponsors this year. Uh, we have. Hamilton, Brooks, Smith & Reynolds, a Boston-based full-service intellectual property firm. Finch & Maloney, a Manchester-based law firm that provides intellectual property counseling uh, and services to technology companies. And Saunders and & Silverstein, a law firm in Amesbury, Mass. that provides services related to trademark, copyrights, uh, internet, software, and entertainment law. So check them out. Um, following today's presentation, we just invite you to join us for some appetizers and beverages. Um, just remember, if you are under 21, um, stay away from the beer. Thank you. Uh, and also, if any of you are I2 Passport students and you haven't checked in with Heather at the registration table, please do so um, at the end. Uh, so next month, we have a really interesting speaker lined up. Um, Unlike this month. <laughs> <laughs> A close second to this month. Uh, that, that date is coming up on um, April 26th, and we've invited, um, I think it's Rana, I can't, I'm not sure if I can pronounce that correctly, Rana Gupta, and he's the CEO of the UMass um, Amherst spin-out, it's called uh, Felsuma LLC, and they're commercializing a new adhesive technology called Gexkin. And it was developed by two researchers at Amherst who were studying how geckos climb and cling to different surfaces. And so their collaboration um, led them to develop a novel adhesive technology that they named Gexkin. And um, the company was launched in 2013 with the help of Mr. Gupta. Um, uh, he's also a teacher at BU's entrepreneurship program in the areas of uh, entrepreneur entrepreneurial finance, innovation, and technology development. So, he should be a really interesting speaker, and that will be our last um, one for the year. All right, so now I'd like to introduce tonight's amazing speaker, Dr. Glenn Schwery, who is the Assistant Dean of Research at SEPS. Um, in addition to his role at UNH, Glenn is a serial entrepreneur. He helped his company Argentech um, pivot from selling handy wipes uh, for cleaning the skin of toxic metals uh, to become a worldwide provider of complex technical services in support of unmanned, air, unmanned aircraft systems or drones. So Glenn has a lot of experience successfully leveraging university resources um, to develop and expand his commercial venture. So we really look forward to hearing what you have to say tonight. Thanks. Thanks for braving the storm coming out tonight. <laughs> um, you're going to see that I'm going to talk about process as much as anything else, but really that Argentech, which is in New, based in Newmarket, really got its start and got a footing because it partnered with the University of New Hampshire. And we kind of did that throughout our, our entire uh, first five years until we really, really got established. We were able to get some other federal contracts, but our first contract was really partnering with the University of New Hampshire on an SBIR. Okay, Small Business Innovative Research Program. So I'm going to talk about the relationship because I had a job at the University of New Hampshire and I was also one of the four principal founders of the company. You know, I had to, to meander in that minefield of con financial conflict of interest. Talk about that a little bit, but you know, it, it was a win-win for a local small business to be able to partner with the university. The university got some funding from our various grants, and um, you know, we funded students, we funded faculty members. So I'm just going to take you through that that uh, this story, and it's my story is version 1.0 because I'm one of four founders, 
And I'll tell you, I'm no longer with the company. I divested a little over three years ago, but they're right in Newmarket and I still do some work for them on the side. Uh, they still try to engage with the university when they need that expertise. So this is my version. Most of our funding came from Department of Defense, federal government, so you have to get used to acronyms. So Argentech Solutions is a New Hampshire veteran-owned small business. Anybody know what Argent means? A-R-G-E-N-T. Uh, it's silvery. There's a little funny story about that. <laughs> so we went from four employees in 2009. There's 70 employees right now. So, you know, almost a 20-fold growth. And now they all get paid. For the first several years, nobody got paid. And for any students, that's the norm, okay? <laughs> You're not going to get paid the first couple of years. And if you go out and get external funding, they're not expecting you to use that for salary. They're expecting you to use that for development of your product. So it's a new, new market-based, veteran-known small business, formed in 2009. Currently, their primary expertise is providing unmanned aerial systems, drones. So they provide flights, analytics, and reporting to several governments. US government's the primary one, but also to commercial customers. As you've heard, you know, drones can be used for just about anything now. People use them in agriculture. You can monitor uh, high-tension electrical wires, cell towers, all types of reasons to, to look at drones now. You can do uh, wind turbine blade inspections using drones now instead of using people. And when you're out at sea, that's very important <laughs> to be able to use a drone and have somebody try to figure out how to get out there in a ship and go up and down a, a wind, three wind turbine blades per unit. So during the past seven years, Argentech has provided four, over 49,000, you can think of this as person days, okay? People have been out in the field on these UAS services, supporting 385 different missions or deployments internationally. This really all started because we got a contract with two partners, one of them was UNH, back in 2009. So if you do the math on this, because I'll come back to this, it's about 127 days per deployment. So when we start talking about their UAS uh, services, we'll talk about that a little further. Like a lot of small startups, it started in the very nicely finished basement of the CEO in Durham. He was a retired naval engineer over 20 years in the Navy, a lot of that at the Portsmouth Navy shipyard. The second principal was also a retired naval engineer, a lot of that time at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, so they knew each other very well. Now what I'd like to stop and talk about here is risk. A little easier to start a company when you have a Navy pension, okay? And you're not relying on this company to pay your mortgage, okay? So these two guys, two good solid engineers, they're nukes, Okay, nuclear engineers, worked at the nuclear subs. Uh, the third principal before I joined is a South African native, elect electrical engineer. Uh, he had startup experience and also some global process automation, both in South Africa and in the United States. So he was the only guy really with startup business um, experience. He also happened to be a neighbor in the cul-de-sac, three houses away from the CEO. So a lot of this is just serendipity. It's who you know, it's who knows you. <laughs> but when the CEO was out away for a weekend, <laughs> the guy from South Africa said, oh, we need to name this, the company Argentech. Silver and silvery, and I guess in South Africa, that's a big deal or something. And CEO came back and go, what's the name? It makes no sense. Who's going to know what we even do? But it's stuck. And so they formed the company called Argentech. And then about a month later, this was in March 2009, in April, they said, we need some science geek kind of guy, <laughs> you know, somebody outside of our universe. And they knew I worked at the university. I'd actually worked with them for a defense contract. They were part of a defense contracting company that supported the Navy after they retired from the Navy. I'd worked with them a little bit, so I knew them. 
they said, why don't you join? So you write a check for $5,000 and you're a principal in the company. So we started out selling, you notice I put handy, H-A-N-D-Y, so I wouldn't be sued, <laughs> okay? We started out selling Hygienol wipes that take toxic metals off of your hands or your clothes or your boots or your rifle or your gun or whatever may have toxic metals on it, okay? Seriously, this is like 50 bucks. You gotta sell a lot of these to support four people, okay? So there is some utility to this. And actually this had been FDA approved, or I mean um, CDC approved, showed that it really was effective. And if you used it as instructed, 90, over 99% of the metals would be chelated by this kind of wet wrap. And it was also wasn't harsh, you know, it was pH balanced, it left your skin nice and soft and smooth. <laughs> so. But there was a need for this. There were toxic metals throughout our environment. Uh, especially we were selling these because these guys are also DOD guys. They said, oh, firing ranges, you know, military bases. Where there's a lot of toxic metals at the Portsmouth Navy shipyard, right? At the uh, Air Force stations, at Air Force bases, etc. cetera. Um, there's lead everywhere, especially at the firing ranges, at the state firing range. We, we were established in 2009, I think in 2008, actually one of the workers at the state shooting range in New Hampshire died of lead poisoning. There was a guy who worked there and there was just so much lead in the atmosphere and it had just deposited on so many things. He had just absorbed too much lead and he actually died of lead poisoning, okay? Then they started putting in air filtration systems after that, okay? And so we're saying, you need to put this in your locker rooms and people need to wipe down. You know, here I was, a university employee, what do I know how to do, write grants? So I actually partnered with somebody at Health and Human Services and we wrote a kind of pediatric grant proposal because what happens is people at the, like the Portsmouth Navy shipyard or people that work where there's lead exposure, they come home and it's on their clothes and it's on their boots. And so they actually bring it into the house. You throw, soap and water doesn't take lead off very well. That's why we had these wipes. Everybody throws their clothes in the laundry together and you, know, you actually get lead contamination on the child's clothes. And lead can be inhaled, can be ingested, but most of the time it's not in your food. It just gets on the kid's hands and then they're always putting their hands in their mouth and they're putting their hands on the food and putting it in their mouth. So that's usually the way that lead accumulates. So we actually had a, we had a product, it worked. We were selling about, wow, 1,300 bucks worth of this stuff a month. <laughs> See, hmm. 15 grand a year divided by four, this is not gonna do it. <laughs> so, this is where it comes to, look in your Rolodex, who do you know, who knows you? I happen to know somebody who knew somebody down in Lowell, Massachusetts at a company called Performance Indicator. At the time I was working a lot of Homeland Security type work and we thought, okay, they made these photoluminescent paints and so glow-in-the-dark paints. That's the demonstration I have for you here, which we can't show because you cannot turn these lights out, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but this is a highway sign on the New Jersey Turnpike. This is what it looks like in the day, and this is what it looks like at night. There are no lights on that. They've painted this on here, and it glows blue, and it glows red, and it glows whatever colors are in the background there. Okay, this looks white. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hand it to you and I'm gonna say, okay, go like that. Put your hand around and you'll see it's bright green. Or we have a toilet paper tube or something. Yeah, I mean, I have a box, but. So, I mean, you'll be able to see if you just shadow it, you'll see yeah. it's green. Now, a lot of people have green and they have green tapes. That's what this is. This is like a white tape of daylight. If you turn the lights out here, this would glow bright green, okay? The good thing, the interesting thing about this company was they had different chemicals. This wasn't just phosphorus, and of course they're proprietary, but they could actually put side groups on these chemicals and get them to change intensity, get them to change color. 
and they had these colors. <laughs> okay, they basically have every color <laughs> that you need. This is a paint, a laminate? This is a paint, okay? This is a paint. And actually, so these are actually emitting right now. Things are color because they reflect color. They absorb one wavelength. They absorb a bunch of wavelengths and don't absorb others. They reflect them. So the reason that this hummingbird's green is because it's reflecting green light on her shirt. So these are reflecting the color, but they're also emitting at that wavelength too. So they're extra bright. Even when the lights are on, they're brighter than usual. Um, this one down here, oh no, this one. In the dark, this glows blue. So they can key chemically these things to be one color in the daylight and a different color in the dark. You can see these are just amazingly bright. And it's cloudy outside. You should, you know, on a sunny day when these things charge up. So these are, things are incredibly bright. So we're talking about a couple of applications for this. Performance indicator, they're in Lowell, Massachusetts. This is at Chicago Transit Authority in a subway station. If you lose power, the handrails and the stairs glow. Okay? This is at the Lincoln Center. You lose power, the stair treads glow. Think about the Super Bowl a couple years ago when San Francisco was playing Baltimore <laughs> and the entire stadium went black for what, 30 minutes or something crazy? You know, they got some auxiliary power. But during that time, and this is just tape that they have on the edge of the stairway, but you'd be able to see if you needed to evacuate, people would actually be able to find the stairs and find the rails and get out, okay? So our guys who are Navy submarine people, they go, what are some other applications? Powder coating is a way to take this pigment, mix it with resin and then you spray it on metals and then you bake it and it's permanent. Okay? They were gonna powder coat hand wheels on submarines. Submarines don't have windows. It's not news to most people, but if you lose power in a submarine, and it does happen, it's just unbelievably pitch black. And it takes a while for auxiliary power to come back up and have these dim lights until they can figure out what's going on. Well, there's certain wheels that are important. I mean, there's certain valves that are important. Turn on and off when you lose power, okay? You wanna minimize uh, some of the hazards that could potentially happen when there's no power. So they said, they're all color coded, okay? Lights go out, I can find the yellow wheel because I know we're supposed to turn all the yellow valves off. I know we're supposed to keep the red ones on. You're not going around with a flashlight and trying to figure out which valve's which, okay? So I said, we could powder coat these. Well, the NHIRC, New Hampshire Innovation Research Center. <laughs> okay, it's state money that matches company money for projects that partner with the university. Argentech partnered with a guy, John Savalas, who's in the material science group. And they said, let's see if we can incorporate, encapsulate this stuff so that we can powder coat it. We can powder coat every color. Not every color is compatible with powder coating. So they're saying, let's try to encapsulate it, protect the chemistry, and then we think that we can put it in a resin and powder coat it. So this is some of the work that John did <clears throat> in the center here. This is the raw pigment. So it's that color when it fluoresces or phosphors or when it emits, it's that color at time zero. And so what he did is he put it in different resins, he encapsulated, had different drying techniques. And on the left is one drying technique, on the right is another. I think you can see in terms of how bright things are, this drying technique was better than the one on the right. Here's what the pigment does over time. In 15 minutes, you can see the intensity's down. The, the hue is down a little bit too. It's changed color a little bit. At 30 minutes, not very bright, and at 120 minutes, not very bright at all. When we went on to performance indicator, they always put you in a room where there's no windows, and they've got this stuff all over the place. Okay, and you're just looking at it like this. Yeah, you see these things on the side of the wall, and you go, yeah, I get it. And then for drama, they go, and watch what happens. And unlike here, they turn out the lights. <laughs> okay. 
and this stuff just goes flash. You can read the newspaper. I could hold this up to the newspaper and read. That's how bright it is. Okay. So that, and your eyes are not dark adapted either. Okay. So pitch black, it's great when this stuff is charged and it emits. In the real world, you know, unless there's a solar eclipse in a couple of seconds, <laughs> that's not the way the world gets dark. So we were thinking about great on hand wheels. The other places is this could be really interesting is in crosswalks, in dimly lit crosswalks, on guardrails, on really sharp curves. There's a place on the Mass Pike or something where there's this really, really sharp exit ramp and trucks are turning over there about one a month because they're not able to anticipate the very sharpness of the curve at the very end. It really gets steep at the very end. And when you got reflectors on the guardrail, you can only anticipate what the curvature is when your headlights hit it. Well, on a curve, your headlights aren't going around the curve very well. We're saying, put this stuff on the reflectors and you'd actually be able to see well ahead because it's not dependent upon lights hitting it. Now, the problem is, okay, let me go back uh, to this one. <coughs> After about 30 minutes, it looks like this. So it starts to get dim. So every hour they would have to charge that sign for about five minutes to get it to glow again. But that's still an energy savings. You only got those lights on that sign for five minutes instead of 60. Okay, so over a 12 hour darkness of nights, you know, they're only on for an hour instead of 12 hours. So we started looking at some other things. This wasn't gonna work um, in a situation where it, you can't recharge it. And we thought on a guardrail system or on a crosswalk system where there's enough cars going by, the car's headlights would actually charge it enough to keep those things emitting when you'd come in. So you'd have, an, uh, you'd have to have enough cars go by and we're talking about one every five minutes or so would be plenty. So we started looking at some other thing. Well, I knew this woman named Jean McGinnis. I saw this in a, this is the South Portland um, petroleum tanks here right at the South Portland uh, port. And they had this worldwide competition for somebody to paint the tanks. And somebody, an artist in South America won. Yeah, you're making a face. <laughs> but this was the winning design. <laughs> to paint these kind of obscure, now this is cartooned, but this was the winning design for the South American painter. Come up, paint all these tanks, and this is what a finished one actually does look like. First couple are done. The jet port's right there too. He said, this is really cool at night to fly over these and see how these go. Hey, performance indicator, let's do a little test sample of doing your photoluminescent paints, and wouldn't that be cool at night? Because this is down to sea level, all the really expensive houses in the hospital are way up on a hill that overlook this just as well. When you're driving on the highway, you can see this. They go, what a cool advertisement that would be for you. The marketing would be amazing. You could have these glow in the dark paints. Not to mention the fact, wherever it is, <laughs> in the daytime, you could have one pattern and at night you'd have a different pattern because the colors would change. So you could change the whole pattern of these things. Jean McGinnis, turns out her husband is in the art department here. So that was another connection. We were going trying to market this thing saying, hey, let's do some work here. <clears throat> um, this is Russell Mason, that's the guy from South Africa. It's Bob Meyer, he's one of the nuclear engineers and you can see he's a color code guy. He's trying to camouflage himself right into the tank <laughs> because we went to camouflage after this. This is Gene, and these are the people that do the real work. This is a, uh, a Dover paint crew, and they got the contract to paint all this. So we're there and saying, okay, you know, we may have to charge these things at night, so maybe we have to put a spotlight on the tops of these tanks. We don't really care about the size so much. Uh, you know, five minutes an hour, five minutes every two hours. It would still be worth it. Performance indicator couldn't get out of their own way, okay? Uh, they'd been in business about 10 years and had sold about the same amount as we had lead wipes. That was friends and family money. And some family must have had a lot of money 
because we saw their books and it wasn't pretty. So Navy guys, right? And it turns out that <clears throat> um, the cake was already baked for this performance indicator product. And you'll find that's the way it is with a lot of government contracts, especially Small Business Innovative Research Awards. Every, who doesn't know what those are? Oh, everybody knows what they are. Great. <laughs> she asked who does know yeah. what they are. Um, basically, it's a set aside of federal money for small businesses. They actually encourage you as well to partner with the university. There's two types. An STTR requires a university partner. An SBIR does not, but they still like to see you get involved with academics. So he said they wanted something called uh, visual detection reduction, meaning reduce seeing it with your eyes. <laughs> okay, so this wasn't instrumented detection, like of a submerged vehicle. This was just visual detection. So if you're flying over with a plane or a helicopter, what we want to do is hide a submarine. Well, in the old days, Submarines were built for World War II to fight in the North Atlantic against a black bottom at several hundred feet of depth. Doesn't matter what color they are. There's no light, you're not gonna see them, okay? So that's why they're black, one reason. The Royal Navy in England actually started painting them dark blue, kind of the color of ocean water. And the idea is when you start coming to shallow surfaces, what if we could match them to the color of the water in which they were uh, flying? Now, you also got you know, aut autonomous surface vehicles or underwater vehicles here, um, which are usually out collecting environmental data or something like that. And you wanna make these bright so you don't hit them. <laughs> okay, you're trying to recover these things. But what if you change the mission for these small mini subs and you're doing intelligence or surveillance, okay? What if I want to hide this? I'm not going to make it yellow. So the government had already known about performance indicator. They were very interested in their technology, but performance indicator did not have the wherewithal. They were never going to be able to do this contractually. They just didn't have the contracting staff to be able to get a federal grant. They were never going to be able to do it in terms of financial auditing. So they just didn't have the contractual capacity or the financial auditing capacity to get a big SBIR. I mean, this is a while ago. Phase ones were about $75,000 and phase twos were about $750,000. Now it's like upwards of a million, million and a half for a lot of phase twos. But still, to get a federal grant from the Department of Defense, you have to be able to pass these audits, DCAA and DCMA, contracting and financial auditing. And then you also, if you're going to do a Department of Defense, you're going to hide a submarine Six months later, this is going to be a classified program, okay? So you're going to have to have secret clearances for your people working on this. There was so much financial trouble at Performance Indicator, and I'm not knocking them. It's just the, the way it was. They were never going to be able to hold security clearances, okay? So I knew some people down there. I took, I took my two Navy guys down there and the South African principal down there. And they turned the lights out, and we were awed. You know, we all went, ooh. And he said, okay, we got an idea. There's this SBIR topic out there. Let's, let's write a program, you know, let's write a proposal and win it. Okay. We already knew we were gonna win it because they wanted this technology from Performance Indicator. They couldn't possibly be the prime, however. So he said, great, we'll be the prime. We got these two guys, former Navy, incredibly regimented, regulated for every minute that they were in the Navy. And then you got the South African business guy whose part, whose, uh, some of his customers were Texas Instruments, General Motors, Ford. He had, been inter he had been working with big companies too. So he actually knew how to get this stuff done. I said, I know what I can do. I can find us a UNH guy who will know something about optics and color and water and ocean. And Shahak Piri, who's at Seacom, and um, he's a kind of an ocean color kind of, or optical clarity and ocean color scientist, um, working with being able to map the seafloor. Uh, he was our university faculty member in this. So Argentech was the prime, 
performance indicator provided the technology. We couldn't do these experiments in this guy's basement, even though it was very nicely finished. So University of New Hampshire also had all the testing facilities for us to be able to do this. And we tried to get the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on board. They said, we'll wait until you're done with phase two and then we'll implement it. Okay. So when you work at the university and you work at a company, you have to manage your financial conflict of interest. So just throwing this out there, it doesn't matter what this says, but it basically says, yeah, I agree to pay careful attention to this. So I'm not trying to make money on both sides. What's dynamic camouflage? <laughs> Using these photochromic technologies, whether it's paints or any other kind of technology, and you're basically modulating the color, brightness and pattern. So we're trying to camouflage. We're trying to get this asset to change color as a function of the water's depth and the water's optical properties. So Portia Hawk had been doing work down here at the British Virgin Islands on Bucks Island. He had to go down there and measure water quality and look at, he was actually using LIDAR to try to map what the bottom uh, organism culture was like, coral reefs. Basically measuring the health of coral reefs using LIDAR, reflected technology. So he's down here in Bucks Island. We just use this as a case. You put a black submarine down here, you're not gonna hide it. Okay, so we need blues and greens because yes, those big SSN submarines are not going into the Persian Gulf or the East China Sea or the Yellow Sea. But if you look at where we've been at war for the last 15 years, you know, we're basically talking about in those environments, Persian Gulf is average is 60 feet in depth. You're talking really shallow water. You wanna hide something. It's not necessarily black on the bottom, okay? So you can optimize this performance. Uh, Jurlov curves are just a way to talk about water clarity and also littoral, which is shallow waters. They have a lot more organics in them and they, they absorb sunlight differently. So reds don't penetrate more than actually just a couple of meters. That's why if you're uh, snorkeling and you're at 10 feet, you're not gonna see any red fish. Red light doesn't penetrate that deep in ocean water. <laughs> Now, if you have your external source and you got headlights, or, you know, you got lamps for your camera, you'll see red fish. But red fish in 10 feet are gray. So <clears throat> it turns out the green light penetrates better in like shallow water where there's a lot of organics. In the open ocean, blue light penetrates better. So what this is really about is how do I put something on the submarine surface so that in this case, the blues and reds are absorbed and it reflects green. In this other case, <clears throat> the reds are absorbed and a lot more of the blue and green will reflect. So I can actually change the color of this hull tile from green to blue if I got the right chemistry on board. This is not a cartoon. This is actually a photograph of some samples that performance indicator, great chemist, just not great business people, great chemists, is that they actually change. This is low illumination and this is brighter illumination. So this is deeper in the water column. This is closer to the water surface. And look at what happens here. When you get closer to the water surface and it's brighter, this area becomes a lot darker and much more bright and much more blue, okay? You look at these areas here. Um, the blue starts to show through on this half. Same thing over here. And these greens get brighter. Okay. So this is kind of dark blue. This lightens up. This is light blue. This darkens up. So if you think away, you know, animal camouflage, that's what they basically do. Okay. They have these cells and they start moving pigments around to blend in with the background. And that's what we're talking about doing here. We can change from one color to another color. Uh, we went to a Navy show and actually these guys were unbelievable. They had, <clears throat> now this was based on ultraviolet light penetration. They had a clear white strip inside the, uh, inside the hall where we were. We walked outside, put it in the sun and within one second it had turned this beautiful purple, <laughs> this lilac. So we're not saying that there's lilac oceans out there, but you know, 
Interior decorators were very interested in this kind of stuff too. You know, you make it the right price, people will paint their walls. It'll be one color in the day and a different color at night. Would it go back to white when you brought it inside? In yep, second? go back to white when you brought it inside. Well, the discharge curve is, is longer on that. So it actually would stay purple for about 10 minutes, okay? So, yeah, I mean, they had just done it as a demo saying, look, we can pretty much make any color and we can have it sensitive to visible light or UV light. So what we did for the testing this at the university, once again, our partnership here is we use the university's tow tank, which is over 100 feet long. And then here's the engineering tank. This is only uh, several meters deep. It's only like two or three meters deep, but it's long. This is uh, 20 feet deep. So we could look in any direction here. What we did instead though is saying, hey, if we put a cover over this and we hang some lights over the edge, we can actually illuminate 100 feet of this. So this is just like looking down 100 feet in the ocean, but we're actually on the horizontal plane. So we didn't have to have a 100 foot deep pool. We could just use this horizontally. And all we did was basically put different painted tiles side by side and then we moved them 20 feet away from the light source, 40, 60, 80, 100. We could move them, you know, six inches if we wanted to, okay? And we could do this with the light shining directly at them, or we could put these down on the bottom and have the light be at an angle. Because you'll see when we actually painted a submerged vehicle, and I can't show you what this vehicle is because it is classified, but you can see it down here. This is about uh, 60 feet long, this vessel, okay? And this is not coated. And then we coated and when we painted it with our photoluminescent paints, and this is it at 60 feet. So this is when it's not coated, and this is when it is coated. It disappears here. This is at 40 feet. We brought it up 20 feet closer to the surface, but of course it's not just the color. It's the angle of the light. So we had helicopters doing all these observations. Um, you can somewhat see the outline right here if you look closely, but there's a lot of reflection from the ocean surface and the ocean surface isn't flat, so it's at all kinds of angles and the light is hitting the observer at various wavelengths, I mean at various angles coming back to the observer. So it's hard to see it here because of where the, the angle of attack of your eyes are. But here, where the light is behind the observer and you don't get that reflection, in fact, it's pretty difficult to see, at, even just at 40 feet. I'll tell you, this is in Hawaii. It was another tough trip we had to make. This was in, in January. We had to go out to Pearl Harbor. But if you've ever been to Hawaii, you know the water's incredibly clear. You could see a black object there in 100 feet of water. Okay. Good thing for academics and a lot of SBIRs, a lot of contracts you have with companies, they could care less about you publishing and in fact they may not even want you to publish. But Shahak and I got two publications out of this, one in a peer-reviewed journal, the other was at a proceedings, this is peer-reviewed as well. So we got two publications out of that SBIR work as well, which is very good. We were trying to go to phase three, which is the commercialization phase. So in small business, there's good luck, there's bad luck, there's no luck, there's proximity to having a neighbor three houses away from you that knows something about how to do business. We were, our CEO is this Navy guy who just, nothing's ever good enough. Nothing's ever fast enough. Not, the money's not coming in ever fast enough. So we were just into phase one, which is six months. We're like three weeks into, he says, any way we can make this go faster, he's saying to the Navy, any way we can make this question mark down there. So he's saying, we could get a private investor and go faster. We could focus on smaller vehicles and vessels instead of the big SSNs. <clears throat> we can get fast track results, which is a, a mechanism then for uh, SBIRs. But it's basically push, 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 push which is great if you're trying to get yourself established. 
you know, sometimes it wears on you a little bit, but that's what he had done for, you know, 40 years, and we weren't going to change that. <clears throat> we didn't get a phase three because we actually went and presented a phase two. Well, I'm not making an excuse, but here's what happened. <clears throat> the program officer was supposed to meet with everybody. We were giving this to a full Navy pitch. Okay, you had to have an SBR to get into this conference, and you were just talking about your technology to a bunch of Navy acquisition people who are going to buy your technology. The good thing about an SBIR, the thing in a business is, you need a business plan. Who's your customer? Okay, how big is your market? What technology do you have? Are you going to manufacture it yourself? Are you going to contract manufacture it? Is it just a service? And it's not a product. The good thing about an SBIR, the government is your customer. The reason that they're giving you this is they want you to develop this so that they can buy it. They're going to buy it at a slightly discounted price, but they also want you to commercialize it. Take your product. We will buy it. We get some royalty-free license because we helped you develop it, but then we want you to be able to distribute it everywhere else, okay? We want you to be able to sell this everywhere else. We're trying to position ourselves for a phase 2.5, which is bridge money between that and the commercialization, which is millions. <clears throat> The guy we were supposed to pitch to at this thing didn't show up. And everybody was pretty upset. He go, wait a minute, this is like a once in a lifetime you're supposed to do it. He didn't show up. Well, he had had a stroke and was in the hospital. Two weeks later, he had another stroke, was in the hospital. And so once your program officer is gone, it's over. Okay, that was just bad luck. So he said, okay, we're gonna do something else. What he had said for our 2.5 proposal is, we're going to paint these little small submarines, okay, that maybe special operations use. They're probably just going to use it for a mission, right? And then they're going to bring it back, and we're probably going to have to repaint it some different color because they're going to some different place. Maybe they're going to East Yellow Sea in this one. Maybe they're going to Persian Gulf on this one. They're going to bring the thing up. We're going to have to take all that paint off and then repaint it. Well, they didn't have a way to take all the paint off. We said, we do because we know a guy up at Dartmouth that had a small business who developed something called drop blast, water jetting. And now you grit blast stuff and you can clean surfaces, <clears throat> you can clean metal surfaces or composite surfaces or ceramic surfaces by using water jets and they usually have some kind of grit in them, okay? Uh, crushed garnet is what's in a lot of water jetting. This they did this under a partial vacuum, and you could drill a hole in high carbon steel with just water. Now, water jetting is very high pressure, and lots of times when they do the cutting and the cleaning, you can cut soft stuff with just water, but not hard stuff with just water. So it's an eighth of an inch away from the surface. Just for all you who don't do this, you have to write a business plan. <laughs> okay, like I said, who's your market? How big is your market? How are you going to get to your market? Do you have the right people? Do you have to partner with somebody else? Like we partnered with three other groups for this SBIR. When you're four people, you can't do everything. You just don't have the expertise. Just an interim. We were able to drill a hole in this from three feet away. Okay, with a water jet where the orifice is 30 microns in diameter. Okay, you couldn't see it, it's so thin. But from three feet away, and we had two students on the project, we funded this for three different semesters, had six students total. They basically built all this stuff from Home Depot. <laughs> okay, and we used a water jet from a company that I knew the principal sales guy in Rochester, Spectex, once again. You know, just it's who you know. So we did all the studies up there. Uh, this is a, <clears throat> we had a mechanized idea here where we kept the jet the same and we moved the material up and down. High carbon steel, this had gray paint on it, it looked just like a battleship <laughs> piece of steel. We could actually profile the steel, etch away, so if it's rusted, you're gonna take all that rust off and it's gonna be pristine and ready to recoat, ready to repaint. 
So we're thinking, hey, we could turn the pressure down and we could take that paint off of this stuff using just water. We don't have to use grit. We don't have mixed waste. We could do this in no time. This lateral shear sideways, so you can see it took the paint off as well on either side. So we could run this up and down three feet per second is how fast you do this. Three feet per second. This is a single jet. We we're going to make a shower head and we could just strip a, we could strip that vessel in no time. Repaint it and you're ready to go to the next mission. Three feet per second and how wide of a band? Huh? Well, this was unfortunately, it's like double the width of the orifice. So this is like 60 microns. <laughs> okay. So it's going to take you a while to do a, an inch ribbon. Yeah, but if we had 100 jets, oh, okay. yeah. <clears throat> so drop blast, promising technology. It had actually been on somebody's shelf for about 10 years. The Navy was this far away from saying, yes, we're going to use this. What we were going to use it for is cutting off submarine hull tiles. Right now it's done by hand with a knife. <laughs> we say robotics, right? We'll just have a robotic crawler come. We can cut this thing at an angle and just remove that submarine hull tile stuff, which has lead in it, so it's all toxic waste. <laughs> so we think we can take it off as a sheet. We can actually get under it and just lift it off, you know, with the right robotic tool. That didn't work out either, okay? So I'm just telling you, you know, we had successes. You have failures. You have to expect probably more failures than successes. Uh, we wrote some proposals. We say, hey, we know all about visual detection, visual signature reduction. Navy Air Systems <coughs> came out with a proposal and they said, we want to know the difference between flat paint and glossy paint. What we know is glossy paint gives you a signature like this when the sun hits it, and a signature like this when the sun hits it. So it's pretty easy to see a plane when you look up in the sky. Okay. When you use flat paint and it's non-reflective, you don't get this glint. But if you spill aviation fuel or lubricant <coughs> on the flat paint, it basically removes it from the surface. So they say, what's the trade-off in being able to detect with glint versus the maintenance costs? And maybe you guys can mess around because you've been working with paints. <laughs> Maybe you can have a little bit more resistant paint that's flat and not glossy. We wrote the proposal this, didn't win. So I'm an academic, I write proposals, you know, I'm trying to partner with it. these guys are saying, we're done. <laughs> we're done responding to SBIRs and SB We need to get something that actually <coughs> brings in a steady source of money. So what they did is they pivoted. The two Navy engineers used to work at this Navy support company. And there was a third guy that used to work with him who now was out in Washington, the state of Washington. The state of Washington is the headquarters for a company called In Situ, which has subsequently been bought by Boeing. In Situ makes this drone. This is a 21 foot wingspan that can fly for 21 hours, <laughs> uh, carries about seven gallons of gasoline can fly for 21 hours on seven gallons of gasoline. You fold these wings up, fold, uh, fold some of this body over, and two guys put it in a trunk and can carry it away. Okay? It does not weigh 200 pounds. That's why it can fly for so long. So they make this, it's called Scan Eagle. This guy said, he knew them, he said, hey, in situ, has a contract from the federal government and they have a small business set aside where they have to have a certain percent small businesses do their work for them. And they have an open solicitation right now. Why don't you write a proposal to them? Well, these guys knew all about government contracting. They wrote a proposal. We won. We subsequently became <clears throat> the number one service provider for in situ. And that's when we went from four of us to 70 of us in about two years. <laughs> Hired all these guys. They're flying in. Okay, this, this is back in like 2011, 12 now, okay? <clears throat> we're flying in Afghanistan. We're flying in Iraq. 
we're doing what's called ISR, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. So you're flying for 21 hours, you're flying 24 hours at a time, seven days a week. That's why when I said, when you look at those deployments and they're 127 days, that's 127 days without a day off. <laughs> so what you do with your staff is you send them out there for four months and then you bring them back for two months and they do nothing and you pay them. Okay, because you can burn out really fast. So you gotta treat your guys right. <clears throat> we knew that we had the contracting expertise, we knew we had the finance expertise, we could hold security clearances. Argentex still holds mine. I have a secret clearance. They are holding it for me if I case to do anything. Um, what Argentech does now is they develop training, operational procedures, certification for unmanned aerial systems. Um, they have some of the most experienced operators. That's why they're the number one provider now and beyond the visual light of operations. Used to be now with a drone, you have to be able to see it at all times, okay? They don't have to see theirs at all times. They're running it on a joystick, a little bit like the guys you know, you're talking about in New Mexico or wherever they are. They're flying the ones halfway around the world. Okay, but they have, <coughs> their pilots have over 100,000 hours of operating experience. And the good thing is, it's not just on this platform. It's on this platform and this platform and this platform. So, now you've diversified your portfolio, so to speak, and you can go after other work. And Argentech has gone after work with the UN. The UN does surveillance of animal reserves for like rhinoceros poaching, for like elephant poaching. So they're in Africa and they're flying drones around, especially at night, and they look, they use night vision, infrared detection for heat. And if they see a Jeep driving through this animal preserve at night, you actually know that's a poacher. And then they send the people out to go intercept the Jeep. Okay? Uh, they're on Navy ships, they're on NATO ships. There's something called precision agriculture, where you measure the health of your crop with a drone. Okay, not going out driving in the field and looking at each thing. You can actually tell the water content of the soil. You can tell the fertilizer content of the soil. So you don't have to fertilize your entire field. It's just where the fertilizer is low this time, where the water is low this time. You think about the way they grow grapes in Europe, in France, in California, and everywhere. They're always on hillsides. Water runs downhill, so lots of times the bottom of the, of the vineyard is well watered and the top's not. That's where you have to put water. You don't have to put water on everywhere. You can look at <coughs> a company in Fitchburg called Headwall. Headwall Technologies, I think. Um, they have hyperspectral imaging where you can tell the sugar content of grapes. So you can actually point this at a bunch of grapes and tell how much sugar's in it and you say, we're gonna harvest this tomorrow because it's at just the right amount of sugar content. They actually use it also in lines of fish production or fish processing. And you can tell which fish is rotten and which fish is not rotten. Something has to move. So the camera stays same, stays static, and the fish move by it. And some guy pulls out, you know, every time there's a signal, you pull out that fish. And they told me they send those to Europe. And the ones that pass, you're here, but I don't know. So if you're not a US citizen, you have to like close your eyes and put your hands over yours for the next slide because this is business sensitive. Good, everybody's here as a citizen. <laughs> so the other thing that, what's good about Argentech and what they're doing now, and remember this all started with us putting some colored panels in a UNH tow tank. That gave us a government contract. It gave us credibility with the government. We were able to execute a contact contract. We were able to hit timelines. We were actually early. Our phase, phase two is normally two years. We did it in 18 months. So we were to show the government, even though we didn't get a phase three, we gave you exactly what you wanted under budget, less than the time you asked for. So what Argentech does really well <coughs> is part of the problem that a lot of companies have with drones, they buy some fancy schmancy drone and it doesn't really do what the customer wants. Argentech understands it, what's the customer asking for, and then you match the sensor, and you match the technology, and you match the drone platform with what they need. 
You know, don't go, don't go over budget, don't go under budget, don't give them less than they need, don't give them more than they need, and then you're gonna get that contract. And they've got the personnel now in terms of pilots, maintenance people, and analytics, people who understand the data as it comes out of the drones, that they give the customer exactly what they want, whether or not it's these pine trees are infested with a beetle or there's 10 bad guys that tend to meet here every Wednesday at three o'clock, you know, in some foreign country, or there's poachers going in there at this time. So what they've done internally is, and here's some more success, they now have an office in Colombia, so they've spun out another company called Sempmira that operates <clears throat> throughout Latin America and in Colombia. They have now Argentech South Africa with our South African native who speaks fluent South African with an English accent. <laughs> and they have, they have uh, offices in Iraq and Afghanistan. So they have the expertise for government contracting and execution. Um, one of the important things is having international contacts people that know in-country rules and regulations and processes and whether you need to go around certain people. In South Africa, in fact, when we set up the South African country, you have to have South African employees. You just can't send your employee over there. So in fact, the head of the company has to be a South African. Well, thankfully this guy knows he's got relatives over there. And so, you know, there's nepotism, but <laughs> we were able to put a South African in as the head of the company. And they have technology support. They say they don't develop technology themselves, but they're a technology insertion company. So they see other people's technology say, here's where this would really fit well. We win, you win, the customer wins, and that's a success story. Next chapter, I don't know, but it's very important that Argentech be solvent and be profitable because when I exited the company, I told them you can do it on a five-year payment plan. So they owe me two more payments <laughs> on my stock options. Um, but I think they're very well positioned to enter in the commercial world <clears throat> for once again, precision agriculture, for there'll always be intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. There'll always be government money. There's illegal mining taking place in Colombia. You know, they're tracking for that. Um, stealing goods in and out of various places. Um, they're in the international market. They're in three or four different company, countries now. And the future for them looks bright. And if it gets dark, they can switch to IR <laughs> and see night vision. Uh, science and technology side, okay? So they don't, um, they're not doing real estate photography, okay? They're doing some high tech stuff where, you know, people wanna know, what does this mean? Okay, I, I, need to do, I need to do a bridge inspection for corrosion. Instead of climbing up in there, you can take a small little drone and you can basically go everywhere, get really incredible high resolution pictures. You can see cracks, not that they couldn't from the ground, but cracks in that Florida bridge. Okay, well you can see a crack on the I-95 bridge, right in the middle of the span, underneath, you know, by using a small drone with a high resolution camera. You can see cracks in a wind turbine blade, you know, 15 miles out to sea. So that's the kind of S&T stuff we're talking about. So Argentech will be around. I'm sure they'll be around for a couple more years. You know, they still 70 strong. Doesn't look like we're getting out of Iraq or Afghanistan anytime soon and other places. Uh, I guess the last white male rhino died yesterday in northern something white right now, but still animals protect. Uh, NATO still has a lot of work. UN still has a lot of work, so I think they're good to go. Any questions? Comments? You want to pass some more colored stuff around? I think we have time for two questions. Sure. Okay. A couple questions, yeah. So I can follow the story about you and these, you know, these Navy buddies <laughs> that you know, bounce from one idea to the next. How did it work as far as the business is concerned? So you started as Argentine and <coughs> wipes, and then you went to the paint. Did you merge or acquire or, or partner with them? How did you become principal? What does all that mean? Yeah, well, principal just means you're one of the original founders, okay? But 
in terms of there's myself and three other principals, okay? And actually that's still the same number. We've given shares to some other people, the CFO and a couple of other people, but still in terms of the board of directors, it's still the four. I'm, I've removed myself now and they've replaced me, but um, you usually do teaming agreements with people and say, so partnerships. So in fact, on the SBIR, we were the prime contractor and then we hired two other companies. We hired Performance Indicator to provide the, the paint technology, and we hired the University of New Hampshire to do the testing. So they're subcontractors to us. Okay, in every single partnership that we've done, that's what's happened. Now, in terms of uh, unmanned aerial s systems, in situ is the prime contractor, and Argentech is a subcontractor to them. There's four other subcontractors that are flying too but they have much fewer seats, they have much fewer deployments. And if you're talking about you're charging the prime, let's just say it's over $100 an hour. If you have 30 seats, 30 positions, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, the cash register starts to crank the numbers pretty high. Whereas somebody else has 10 seats, kind of hard to survive. So we've got 70 employees. Now, remember those guys, a third of them aren't deployed because they're home trying to recoup. And lots of times, you know, you hire these former military guys, they've, uh, you know, they've volunteered or they've been in ROTC or something like this. And so for four years, they're in the military and then they can, they can leave the military. They're military pilots. You have to be a pilot to do this. So they're established pilots and they can do this and make a boatload of money because they get hazard pay depending on where they go to, okay? And we found one of the, one of the management problems from an HR perspective is <laughs> they deploy for two months, uh, for four months, come home, and the single guys <laughs> will go to the Caribbean for six weeks, and, you know, it's hard to find them. <laughs> you know, they're partying for six weeks, and we go... Okay, you need to come back here and like do a push up because you're going back out in two weeks, you know, or something. So we, we, haven't, we haven't bought any companies. They've spun out some companies, South Africa and the one in Colombia. But they have a Spanish speaking person in Colombia and they have a South African speaking person in South Africa. Anything else? Yep. Are you uh, formed as an LLC or incorporated as a C-corp? It's an S-corp. S-corporation. And, uh, you know, once again, the, <clears throat> the CEO was very aggressive and said, we're going to make a boatload of money and we're going to sell $2 million worth of this stuff <laughs> to every firing range and military base. So an S-corporation, for people who aren't familiar, is the bad part about that is the profits, if you are profitable, all the profits have to be distributed at the end of the year, so the individual owners pay income tax on it. The corporation doesn't pay the corporate profits. It goes to the individuals, and you have to pay it as an individual. So there were four of us. So four of us were paying income tax on the company profits. Yeah, so it just puts you in a higher tax bracket, and you get a big tax burden at the end of the year if you haven't done your quarterly payments. But you're also getting that distribution at the end of the year. You know, if you've netted $100,000, you're each getting $25,000. Yep. Done, Chelsea? All right, so I think, um, thank you so much for sure. coming. I think you're, you're willing to stay on and talk to everyone as we... As long as she gets me a plate of food, yeah. Yes, there's lots of food, uh, lots of uh, things to drink. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, don't forget, if you're an I2 Passport student, to um, register or check in at the front desk. Um, thank you so much for coming and join us next month. <laughs>